you would turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and find the first verse. Once you have found that, if you please stand with me, and we will honor God with the reading of his word. First John, chapter 3, beginning in the first verse. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Oh, Father, Lord, you're... Your grace is sufficient. I ask you, Lord, I beg you, Lord, to speak through me in my weakness to these that you have gathered. Oh, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would impress upon the hearts of all who are here the importance of who you are, your word, and our relationship with you. Oh, Father, I pray also that I would not hinder your word from being spoken. That it would simply be you speaking through me. Thank you for these that you have gathered here in your house. In Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. It is, it is common, we are all used to talking about and, and knowing who God the Father is, right? That, that's common amongst all denominations. That is, is common amongst those who saw, call themselves Christian. In fact, it is even common among those who do not belong to Jesus Christ. There are many who do not belong to him who, who will still call him father. Who will still call themselves to be his, his children. So the question is asked, and we have discussed this here before, is everyone a child of God? Is everyone a child that, that uh, is born again of the Spirit? Well, the scripture would teach us that, that they're not. See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. There's a great significance in that, isn't there? Isn't there a significance in being the children of somebody? Today I look out and I see three of, of my four children. And I think of the love in my heart to see that they are here with the person that is most important to each of them. And I think of how, how that makes my heart feel. I want you to know that God loves you the same way and greater than what my love for my own children are. We are, John goes on to say, children. Not everybody is. As I look at first, excuse me, at John 1, chapter 12, the Gospel of John 1, chapter 12, says, But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, that is a right that is given to those who receive him and believe upon him. So someone who has not received the Lord Jesus Christ is not his child. Well, that's contrary to what the world teaches us, isn't it? 
the world teaches us, and, and we talked about this this morning in the earlier sermon, that everybody's God's child. We hear it all the time, and, and it's in the popular writings of the time, and, and so-called Christian writings of the time. They're all God's children. Well, if we're all God's children, how come he has to give us the right to become his children? And that right comes through our receiving him and believing in him. So that means all we have to do is receive and believe, right? We can handle that. All we got to do is do it ourselves. How do we receive him? Is it something that we just automatically do? Is it something that we learn in church? Is it, is it something that the, the preacher has you say at the end of the service during an invitation and you come forward and, and the preacher has you say something? Is that receiving Jesus? Is that believing? Is believing Jesus, is, is it believing in him or believing what he says? You see... To be his children goes back to that same thing that we preach week after week. Our hearts need to be regenerated. We need to have God give us a new heart. In that comes faith. In that comes believing. In that comes the receiving. Do you know what happened when, when man, throughout the scriptures, sees the glory of God? What does man do? He falls on his face, doesn't he? He hides himself from God because the glory of God is so great. And we're to be the child of this God. How can we do it? How can we see who he is? Apart from him changing our heart. He's given us the right to be children. Over the next chapter, here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, In his love, excuse me, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, we didn't love God. And draw his love to us. When he regenerated us, he showed us his love for us. When he gave us a new heart, it changed who we were to the very depths of our soul. And when he changed that, then we knew what love was. Then we believed. Then we were able to love him. Then we knew our need to repent. We saw our wickedness. We saw our wretchedness in light of his holiness. And when we saw that, if he has changed our heart, we had to repent. We had to turn away from it. You know, our sin is an easy thing for us to try to cling on to, isn't it? We all have those things that we know aren't quite right. Is that the way to say it? Aren't quite right. But we don't want to quit. We don't want to let go of. And yet we know we should. But the reason we don't want to let go of them because we refuse to see ourselves in light of who he is. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe on him would have eternal life. 1 John 4, verse 17 says, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is, because he is.
is, as he is, so also are we in this world. His love is perfected in us and in our receiving him. By the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and what the Holy Spirit does in our, in our heart. It says, for this reason, though, is why the world doesn't know who you are. Because it did not know him. Often it's not that the world doesn't know who you are. It's that the world does not want to know who you are. Because you convict them by your presence. I, I think of the old, the old story of Billy Graham on the golf course. He had come in and they put him into a, a group to make a foursome and they, they're out golfing and they get towards the end and one of the men storms off the golf course and said he couldn't golf with, with Billy Graham convicting him like that and Billy Graham um, making him look bad. Billy Graham hadn't done anything except for beating him. Why did they hate Jesus? Because they didn't like what Jesus stood for. Some didn't know him. But many didn't want to know him. Because they liked the way things were. So it says the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It doesn't know him. I think sometimes when I'm doing something for somebody and I, I've, I've given my, my heart to something for somebody and then there's no appreciation. Has that ever happened to you? In fact, not only is there no appreciation, you might even go as far as to say it went the other way that, that not only did they not appreciate it, but, but they scorn you for having done for them. Has that ever happened to anybody? I remember years ago, we were trying to help a, a family, and we'd given a car to this family, and I told this, this man that um, I'd give him two weeks to get his tags and get insurance on the vehicle. <coughs> Three weeks later, I showed up to get my tags so I could cash it in, and, and he hadn't done it yet, and I said, no big deal. I gave him two more weeks. In two weeks, I showed up again. And he cursed me out and told me his children were never allowed to come to our church again because I was bothering him about getting tags. See, folks, the world, the world doesn't understand the heart of God. As Christians, it's hard for us to, isn't it? Isn't it hard for us to understand how... God would send his son to pay for the debts of his enemies. Isn't that difficult? But it's also hard it's also hard for us to understand how the son who went to the cross and took our debt, who took the, the sin of the world upon himself, how, how this son did it for the joy that waited How can you find that joyful? We don't understand the sacrificial love that God has given us to make us his children. You see, we have this desire to live for ourselves. We, we have those things and do those things that we want to do. And that's all fine and dandy as long as God doesn't get in the way. But when God gets in the way, when we have to make a decision between what is right by God and what is right by this world, He reveals what we believe about Him, doesn't it? John goes on to say, Beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children now because of what he has done. Not because of what you have done. 
You received him, you believe because of what he has done. We are his children now. And John says, hear this joyous thing. What we, uh, what we will be has not yet appeared. What that's going to mean to us in all of its fullness, we can't understand yet. In all the fullness of who God is and what he has done in us, we do not comprehend the joy of being here. Instead, instead, we keep holding on to this world, to this life. Instead, we just don't believe God. We don't believe God that there are things that we are waiting for in Him are greater than the things in this world. And so what we do is we, we start grabbing everything that we think will bring us pleasure now. And what does it do to us? Any pleasure that it brings is very fleeting, isn't it? It's very short, very weak. We don't know what even we're going to be yet. Because when he returns, it goes on to say here, you can find a place. Um, beloved, we are children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. What is he like? Do you know what Jesus Christ is like? Do you know what God the Son is like? God the Son is not worried about the frivolous, is he? God the Son is not worried about the things of this life and this world. I love how Paul puts it. Paul says, it, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When we have those desires for things that we know are not honoring to God. And folks, it could be, it could be the simple things as well as the complex but when we have those desires for those things, we are thinking of ourselves and this world and our temporary pleasure and not the eternal pleasure. Romans 8.15 says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but received a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out on the Father. We did not receive the spirit of fear from God. But when we fall into those things that we know we don't need to be into, isn't that what it creates in us? Outside of Martin Luther, I don't know too many people, or know of too many people, who every time they sin, they confessed it. What really happens to us is when we sin, it takes us a while to get our mind around that God really will forgive us again for the same thing. Anyone else ever been there? And, and so instead of getting to our faces before him in fear, we think, well, he's not going to forgive me. He gave us the spirit of adoption as sons. That we are his and that we will appear with him and be like him. We will Jesus, when 
Jesus died on the cross and paid that debt for us. He was looking to the future for you who belong to him. Galatians 3.26 says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. He was looking ahead for you, to you. It says what we read earlier, that he would be our propitiation of our sin. That's 1 John 4.10. He took our place so that we could be like him. That we could receive the adoption of the Father. He took our place. You know, sometimes we get to reading God's word and we react like we can't understand it. Or, or we take it out of, out of context. I, I listened to a lot of sermons in the last two weeks. I listened to one of... of uh, Somebody. <laughs> J. Vernon McGee, thank you. And he told a story about not listening to God's word. He said that, that one day a man was, was driving down the road and, and there was a truckload of pigs in front of him. And a small pig fell out of that truck. And so he stopped, he picked up the little piglet, he put it in his car, and he was racing, trying to catch up to that truck. And while he was doing that, he was speeding and got pulled over. And the officer was telling him about how fast he was going, asked him why he was doing it, and he told the officer, well, this little pig fell off of that truck, and I was trying to catch that truck so I could return the pig to him. And the officer said, that truck's too far away. He said, don't you just take that pig to the zoo? So he said, okay. The next day, he was going pretty much the same intersection, and he got pulled over again. The officer came up to the car. He said, sir, he said, I thought I told you to take that pig to the zoo. He said, I did. We had such a good time. We're going to the beach today. <laughs> we don't listen to what's being said sometimes, do we? Now, none of us here thought that he meant for him to take the pig to enjoy the beach or enjoy the zoo, right? we would just take God's word for what it says. <coughs> we just take it for what it says. The joy that would fill our soul. But we're going to be like him in future glory. Romans 8.18 For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. Paul says, all these things I'm suffering now are nothing. They're nothing. Has anybody here suffered anything ever? Has anyone suffered loss ever? Loss of someone you love? Loss of something you love? Has anyone ever suffered Poor health? Has anyone ever suffered the, the persecution of somebody else? <coughs> Has anyone here ever faced what Paul did? Paul faced being killed for his faith. It ultimately was, wasn't he? But Paul says, I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing to the glory. We got our eyes in the wrong thing, don't we? Oh, how easy it is to get caught up in the fact that that we're we're sick and we're lacking and we we're, we're this and we're that and we don't and we do we all these other things of this world we get so caught up in them that we miss His all sufficient grace that reveals His future glory. Ephesians 1, verse 5, says he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. 
And he's going to give us everything that will fill our hearts with the greatest joy in seeing his glory. Paul also said it this way. He said, 2 Corinthians 4.17, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It is preparing us for this eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. <coughs> There's nothing else like it. There's nothing else like it. Why do we give that up? Why do we ignore that for the things of this world? Why do we think that, that the things of this world are so good and they're so bad? Because they're taking us away from Him. It's not that intrinsically so many of these things are bad in themselves, but when they take us away from Him, that makes them mad. In uh, Romans 8, 29, again, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that they might be the firstborn. I was thinking this week about his foreknowing us and his predestining us. And I was thinking about the Lamb's Book of Life and how, how it was before the foundations of the world. And then it really dawned on me that before the words in Genesis that in the beginning was God and that he hovered, his spirit hovered over the darkness. Before that, before that, before he said, let there be, before that, he predestined us to be his children. And we shortchange ourselves. Not just the things of this world, but we, we also shortchange ourselves getting caught up in religious activity. Not Christian activity, not things that honor God, but just things to keep the Christian busy. Second Corinthians four, verse eleven. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. That life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. We're constantly trying to do these religious things and these worldly things for ourselves when we need to be given over to death. When we need to die of ourselves, quit worrying about number one, being yourself, and start thinking and turning to those things of God. And this is what he does. Philippians 3.21 Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That our, our mortal bodies let me, let me put our mortal body another way. Our dying aching wearing out Flesh. It's going to be replaced, changed, transformed to a glorious body. As I as I read this and I see, as I see this. I I come to this third verse here. It says, and everyone who thus hopes in Him 
purifies himself as he is pure. Because of what he's done in us, we should be working hard to cleanse ourselves of all unrighteousness, correct? And be covered in his righteousness. The first Corinthians, Paul tells us this. This is 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Right now we don't see it as much. But it's coming. We have to put our hopes in him. Stop living for self. And so a familiar, familiar verse. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21. We all know this, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who has but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. All the religious activity, all the jockeying to make yourself look good doesn't change what's in your heart. You either belong to the, Je the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he has done in you or you do not. And so we can't earn it. We can't earn it. We continue to put our hope in him and we do it. And we live this lifestyle Dying of self so that he be seen. But it's so easy to get distracted. Just a little diagnosis of sinusitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, prostatitis. It's just that little diagnosis can change a person's attitude. The fact is. There's nothing I face here. No trial that you face here. There's nothing you give up here. I go back to the man who, after being baptized, decided he should find out what it is that he has to, to give up to be a Christian. There's nothing you give up that even compares to what's waiting ahead of you if you belong to Jesus Christ. There's no comparison. But instead, we cling to what is not lovely. Eternally lovely. For those things that do not bring joy to us, we cling to them Instead of turning to Christ. So I ask you, are you called to be a child of God? 2 Corinthians 7 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Bringing holiness to completion in fear of God. And that will bring us to Revelation 24, or 22, verse 4. It says, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Are we his? Is his name written? in us and on us? Are we in him? Are we children of his? Or is he going to say, be gone. I never knew you. It is by God's word. It is 
by his word. And anything in us changes. Go to his word. Go to him. That your joy may be complete.